people are still coming in. People are still coming in, but maybe I get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Tersaki seminar series. Today we have Professor Alvaro Mata from University of Nottingham. He's a professor in biomedical engineering and biomaterials in the School of Pharmacy and the Department of Chemical and Environmental Engineering. He has a bachelor's from University of Kansas and a master's from University of Strathclyde and a doctor of engineering from Cleveland State University working with uh, Shuaroy at the Cleveland Clinic. He also conducted his postdoctoral training with Professor Sam Stupp at Northwestern University from 05 to 08. His research is at the interface of supramolecular chemistry, structural biology, biofabrication, and engineering to develop innovative ways to build with molecules for tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. His work has led to more than 75 papers, eight patents and applications, and publications in leading journals such as Science, Nature Materials, Nature Chemistry, Nature Communications, Science Advances, etc. And his research has been covered in media such as Sky News, The Times, The Telegraph, BBC Radio, and international scientific media outlets such as Chemistry World, Physics News, and Nature Chemistry News and News. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you, Mehmet. And <clears throat> let me share the screen. All right. Can you see the screen, Mehmet? Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. So good morning and or good evening. Um, thank you for being here and, and thank you to the Tarasaki Institute for the opportunity to present our work. What I'm gonna uh, tell you are different ways that we are uh, developing to engineer materials, different types of materials for biomedical applications. And what I, what I start with is with a brief introduction to tell you about our philosophy of how we, of why we're developing materials through this approach that we call supramolecular biofabrication. So if you take, if you take, actually, I don't know if you can see my title here. Let me see if I can move this. All right, so if you take these tissues, these are three different tissues. So we have mu muscle, bone, and dental enamel. Um, they all have different levels of cellularity. Um, they look very different, but they all have an incredible functionality, enormous functionality, almost uh, on parallel uh, functionality. Um, they're all formed or they have been formed by cells interacting with their environment or that extracellular matrix. So this interaction between cells and the ECM is essential to lead to all these different tissues. And what makes these cells and these, these extracellular matrix, what makes them what, what they are composed of are basically the same building blocks, like Lego pieces. These are the, the, the main building blocks of life, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, DNA, and some small molecules. So biology has evolved um, to, to, to assemble, to biofabricate from the molecular scale in a supramolecular manner, meaning aggregating and organizing molecules at different size scales um, in a hierarchical manner um, up to what we call tissues and organs with this incredible functionality. So what we aim to do in the lab is to try to harness some of these mechanisms that biology has evolved to organize these molecules across size scales. And this is what we call these supramolecular biological organization principles. So you may be familiar with self-assembly, for example. Um, self-assembly is the mechanism by which small components can come together to create a bigger component in an organized and reproducible manner. This in biology tends to happen uh, with different types of components, such as in the cell membrane, for example. When you have that assembly into a structure, you tend to generate compartments. There's a separation and that tends to, to trigger diffusion and movement of molecules. For example, in diffusion reaction processes like you see here, so which tend to generate patterns. So usually when you see patterns in nature, uh, this is because there has been some, some kind of diffusion reaction process. 
Uh, there's a lot of interest of how proteins function with, especially with, with um, a growing amount of data of the importance of disorder, disorder regions. Proteins are basically chains of amino acids that have regions that are order and disorder. And that, that interplay between the two, um, it's very important for the functionality, but that, that um, what defines that functionality has to do in many cases of how proteins interact with, that, uh, with other proteins or with other components to, to, to trigger these transitions of disorder and order. And also some uh, non-equilibrium system. So all these are these biological organization principles Again, that biology has evolved and that we are trying to develop uh, um, or to create, to, to, to incorporate within engineering processes to design materials. And that's what, that's our approach. Can we actually create a supramolecular toolkit that we can incorporate with different engineering principles and techniques to assemble, to grow, and to, to engineer functional materials? Okay. But why, why go through all of this? Well, first of all, and this is very critical, biological systems are not simple. They're everything but simple. They're very complex, cells, tissues, organs, almost no matter at what scale you look at biology, this is, you will find complexity. Now this compositional and structural complexity is what gives rise to the, to the incredible functionality that we know of our tissues and our organs. And so there is a great need to enhance this complexity and the functionality of materials to better recreate the properties of these biological systems, such as tissues and organs. Um, for what? Well, to improve regenerative therapies, there's great interest and a great need to be able to regenerate better, faster, more effectively. Um, the, the world population is aging and we need to find ways that we can regenerate our bodies uh, better. And here, I just wanna give you an example. The gold standard of almost any, um, um, any uh, situation that requires regeneration continues to be autographs, bone, tendon, uh, nerve, skin. There are many technologies we're working on, but autographs, meaning pieces of tissue from the patient uh, uh, implanted in the region where the defect is, continues to be the gold standard. So there's a great need to generate materials that, that can enhance, that, that have an enhanced functionality. There's, in that, th there's different ways in which people are developing these materials for regenerative therapies. There's also a, uh, an interest in in vitro models. Uh, there's a great interest in creating materials that can recreate in vivo environments. So more complex environments, but in vitro. And here you see a number of, of applications that uh, result from having these, more, these physiological or at least more physiological in vitro models so that we move away, for example, uh, from a Petri dish and start developing materials with that enhanced compositional and structural complexity that can, that can give us that functionality of biological systems. Okay, so these are the applications that we're working towards uh, and, and the examples I'm gonna show you uh, which are basically, uh, there are a number of examples um, that I'll, I'll take you through um, and I've divided in two different, in two different sections, but I'll, I'll take you through them. Okay, so let me start with, with self-assembling materials. And here I want to bring uh, a system developed by Sam Stoop at Northwestern University. Um, these are peptide amphiphiles, and I'll continue to refer to them as PAs. This is a very powerful platform. These are basically small molecules. They're amphiphilic, meaning there's a region that is hydrophobic, it hates water, and a region that is hydrophilic, it likes water. And they are designed, they have a structure that uh, enables them to collapse when, when chargers are screened. So when you have a charged PA and you present it to an opposite charge, whether it's an ion or another molecule, that charge of the PA will neutralize and it will trigger the assembly of micelles. But these micelles won't be spherical. They will be cylindrical, just like you see in this illustration or in this SEM image. And so this ends up being a very powerful platform to develop matrices, nanofibrous matrices uh, that can 
um, recreate some of the elements of the natural extracellular matrix. And <clears throat> the other element, important element I didn't mention is that on these sides of the peptide, you can incorporate bioactive sequences, different sequences that we know uh, are present in proteins and are actually signaling cells to do things. They can be incorporated here. So when they assemble into the fiber, they will always be on the outside of the fiber. And so you end up with a nanofibrous matrix with a high um, density of functionality uh, that you can incorporate here. All right, so this is, uh, this is a system that we work with. I had the opportunity to work with Sam as a postdoc. And we've been looking into different ways to try to, to, um, to work and enhance these materials. So one of the, the things we've done, and this is to improve the mechanical properties because there's no covalent cross-linking here. This is all non-covalent interaction. So they tend to be quite soft materials. Uh, this is work that was laid by Carlos as a PhD student in the lab, uh, which we started to look at ways to, to incorporate host guest uh, systems. Or, um, and in this case, what we do is we synthesize PAs with cyclodextrin or adamantane in this case, so that we can trigger the assembly of the fibers. But then the fibers are going to present on the outside, either the host or the guest. And when the two fibers come together, they will interact and enhance the mechanical properties. They will trigger an interfiber, basically interaction that will enhance the mechanical properties of the resulting of a nanofibrous uh, uh, matrix or gel. The other system uh, that, we, that we developed, again, uh, continue to look at this host gas system was instead of assembling them both on the peptides to end up with fibers that interact, <clears throat> here we synthesized um, fibers, with the adamantine uh, um, component, but also then to, to provide functionality and enhance functionality to this matrix, we synthesize, uh, again, bioactive peptides to the cyclodextrin so that when you assemble the gel, you can then present these cyclodextrin moieties with these bioactive peptides and then trigger, in this case, uh, or give the gel cell adhesive properties. So you have here um, a matrix, a PA hydrogel made only with the adamantane PAs, adamantane containing PAs. And when you expose this hydrogel with the cyclodextrin, with the RGD, you trigger this, basically, you, you enable this, this matrix to become cell adhesives. So cells begin to adhere to the matrix. So these are just two simple ex examples I wanted to, to show you of ways to enhance uh, the properties, mechanical properties or bioactive properties of this, of this very powerful platform of PAs. However, if we're going to recreate, again, the complexity of the extracellular matrix, we need to go beyond this because the extracellular matrix, which is basically everything that surrounds the cells in our bodies, is extremely complex. It has a large variety of different molecules. And so we've been looking into a particular way to try to develop um, a system that enables us to increase this this uh, function, this complexity of, the, of these PA hydrogels. And so this takes us to this multi-component self-assembly uh, concept. This is something we've been looking at for a while uh, in the lab, uh, the different people that I'll show you different examples of, of, um, of different examples of how we're using this multi-component self-assembly. But basically to, to, to simplify it, what we are using are these PAs not as main components of, of these hydrogels, but actually as what we call supramolecular um, organizers of ECM components. And so for example, if you have a fibronectin molecule like you have here, we can design PAs that can, that can assemble when they find fibronectin. So you now expose this fibronectin, a solution of fibronectin, you bring a solution of the PAs, the PAs recognize the fibronectin and the fibronectin triggers their assembly into the nanofibers. And what this does is that the fibers assemble, but now with the fibronectin surrounding it. And so what you see here are PA nanofibers, free PA nanofibers assembled into, into a PA uh, uh, by themselves. Uh, and in this case, the PAs are triggered by the protein and you end up with these fibers that are basically templating and are, and are assembling and organizing 
uh, fiber netting on the fibers. And so with this, we've been developing different systems so that we can incorporate other proteins and begin to enhance the complexity of these ECM components, but in an organized fashion, in a controlled fashion. And I wanna show you a couple of examples of that. So first, uh, we started to look at uh, 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 generating matrices that can recreate the tumor microenvironment, ovarian tumor microenvironment. Um, and this is work that was started by Clara, and now Magda has continued as a PhD student. Um, again, what you have here is a very simple way of, of generating these, these, uh, these materials. All you need to do is, is combine a PA solution. And then again, you can have different sequences of PAs with a solution of the proteins of interest. So in this, in this uh, project, we, we chose uh, proteins that are present in ovarian cancer. And as soon as you mix them, you, ge you uh, generate a hydrogel. And this, this process is cell-friendly. So you can incorporate cells and have them embedded within the gel. And when we did that with a triculture, having ovarian cancer cells, MSCs, and endothelial cells, all important uh, in an ovarian cancer, we saw that at a, part, uh, at a particular composition of PAs and proteins, we were able to actually trigger the formation of these mini cancers. So what you see here are spheroids, cancer spheroids, um, that are growing within the matrix. So here's an example of one, you can see it multiple cells and you can see how that, that spheroid is interacting with the nanofibrous matrix that we have provided. Um, <clears throat> when we uh, compared to matrigel, which is a material normally used to grow these type of spheroids, we can see that the cells and the spheroids in our hydrogel uh, behave similarly as they do in matrigel. And also as proof of concept, we saw that when we tested, when we, when we exposed these tumors, these, these tumors growing in our matrix to different uh, chemotherapeutic agents, we saw that they were starting to die like you would expect in a cancer. So here you have in this bar, they keep growing because they're not being exposed to the, to the chemotherapeutic agent. These two are, and you can see how they begin to, to, to die as you would expect in a cancer. So with this study, we then um, started to look for other types of cancers because one of the, the advantages of the system is that it is, um, is modular. So we can now begin to use different protein components of different environments and create another matrix. And so now I'm gonna show you an example of pancreatic cancer using exactly the same approach. Now pancreatic cancer, something I wanna mention is pancreatic cancer is particularly difficult to treat because of the presence of these cancer stem cells or CSCs. Um, and I wanna keep that in mind because of the results I'm gonna show you. But basically we did the same. We developed some PAs that can assemble in the presence, in this case of a different ECM components, ECM components that we know are present in pancreatic cancer and generate these hydrogels uh, where we can begin to grow again, this pancreatic uh, cancer spheroids. Now in this study, which you can read here, um, <clears throat> we compare the results with organoids, spheres, and also to the monolayers. And I wanna, there's a lot of biology in this publication that I, that I uh, encourage you to read if you're interested, but I at least wanted to, to present to you a couple, of, a couple of results. So the first thing is, when you take pancreatic cancer cells and you put them in our hydrogel, those cells are going to behave more like pancreatic cancer, which is basically what you're seeing here. This is upregulation of different pancreatic cancer uh, receptors and regulators. There is more phenotype of a pancreatic cancer on the, on the, on the gel that has the ESEM components compared to the gel that has only the PA. This is very important because what this is telling us is that when the cells open their eyes, you put the cells, you embed them, you assemble the gel. When the cells open their eyes in the gel, what they see at that moment seems to be important for the matrix and the, and the behavior of these cells. They seem to be, if you create a matrix that is more like what they see in the body, in this case, in this particular cancer, they seem to be behaving right away more like cancer cells. Now, if you take patient-derived 
sinograph, so, so cells from patients. And again, you put them within a hydrogel. What we saw, and just very briefly, the more, the, the redder the color here, it just means that there's more cancer stem cell phenotype. Remember what I mentioned that pancreatic cancer uh, is particularly difficult because it has these cancer stem cells. So if we're creating a model of that, we, we want to try to maintain cancer stem cell phenotype of those cells. So here are basically in our gel compared to organoids and, sphere, and spheres, our gel was able to, to maintain a more of a cancer stem cell phenotype on these cells taken from patients. And when you take these cells within these gels and you implant them in mice, you can see here in the blue, it's just showing that we are able to generate more tumors with a higher volume. Basically the growing, the tumors are growing better within the mice. Again, this is something we want. We want to try to recreate how these tumors are growing. So these are promoting tumor growth, which is what we want. And then finally, the final result, and this is very important again, to, to when we treat these cells with chemotherapeutic agents, we see that they are behaving like they do uh, when they do it in, in a patient. So what you see here, these are three different patients. These are these colors are different chemotherapeutic agents. And you can see, as you would expect, that patients react differently to, to the drugs. Some, some patients become more resistant or, or they, they basically, the drugs work better, like you would see in this patient. Here you see the tumor volume is very low. So the, the, the tumor is going away. While here, the tumor is maintaining, even though they are being treated with the same drugs. Now, when you take, and by the way, these are, these are cells taken from patients and implanted in mice, and then the mice are treated, okay? Now, instead of implanting them in mice, you take those cells and you put them in our hydrogel, which you see here. You see, again, the same three patients, you see the trend being similar as the, the cells from the patient in the mice, right? So you have, here with larger volumes, here with lower volumes, the same trend, you see it only in our hydrogels compared to 2D organoids and spheres. And this is a very, this is still um, uh, preliminary, there's still more work to do, but this is very encouraging because he's telling us that the hydrogel that we're providing, the cells are behaving more like they would do uh, from, uh, as, as they are in vivo, which is what we want in a model, right? We want to test different drugs uh, in this model rather than on mice and, and in the patient. Okay, so all, I, again, I, I, I want to point out about this possibility of this modular approach to use PAs to organize ECM components into these functional matrices. And you do it by simply, simply mixing these two solutions. So here I'm going to now uh, uh, change a little bit, but with the same concept of this of mixing two solutions, because what you can do is we can incorporate now within bioprinting. And what we saw was that we can actually take advantage of this liquid in liquid printing. So similar to what I was showing you before, in this case, the peptide in yellow is being uh, printed by uh, this drop on demand printer into a pool of this protein, which is keratin. And what we saw is that we can actually harness and use these hydrodynamic forces that are being generated when the, when the drop is, is basically hitting the pool of protein to, um, to, to direct the, assembly, the assemblies that are taking place. So what you see here is basically this toroidal vortex forming, which always forms when you have a drop hitting a larger volume, but the gelation takes place so, so fast that, that it's, it's taking place uh, as the toroidal vortex is forming. So you end up with these donut shape uh, hydrogels basically. So, and this is, this is very important because what we want to try to do again is develop uh, uh, processes where we can control the hierarchical assembly of these molecules, right? So because of printing of this liquid liquid printing, we can control the micro scale, the shape of these gels, because of the printing, we can control the positioning to a certain extent because this is still liquid in liquid. So there are limitations in terms of the macroscopic resolution, let's say. You, what we saw is we saw also these topographies uh, uh, being shaped on the surface of the hydrogels. Those shear forces are also aiding on the alignment of the nanofibers. So now we're talking at the nanoscale. So we're going from the nano to the macro, 
having control, having a way to control the assembly of these molecules. Again, this is a cell-friendly process. So cells can be embedded, they can be in the, in the peptide, so they will be embedded in the gel or in the receiving protein solution, so they can be coding the gel. Or you can have one type of cell inside, one type of cell outside. Um, this is basically a vision that we have, is how can we take advantage of all these elements I'm, I'm telling you to integrate bottom-up assembly or self-assembly with top-down uh, techniques such as, such as printing, right? So that perhaps we can really have this control of how molecules assemble, but integrated within a, a additive manufacturing approach. So in this way, we may be able to not only control composition, but also topography, porosity, and really a lot of elements that we know are critical for, for cells. And actually, I just wanted to point to this review that we just published on how the, uh, different elements of a hydrogel can be optimized for immunomodulation. So in this case, we did a review of the literature of, of people that have been looking at different uh, stiffnesses, porosities, topographies, wettability, and all their pro uh, properties that can be tuned to enhance immunomodulation of the hydrogen. All right, so that finishes that first part of, of my talk. Uh, now I'm going to move again to continue with the multi-component self-assembly, but now looking at interfacial systems. Now, the, let me just see if I can get my video here. Okay, so something I didn't tell you is when these two components mix, we're counting on diffusion. Remember, it was one of these supramolecular organization principles, right, of compartmentalization and then diffusion uh, movement of molecules to trigger that gelation. Well, you can actually control the properties of that initial interaction to create a diffusion barrier. And what you do, you actually can trigger the assembly on the membrane only. So here you have the PAs that I was showing you. In this case, they are positively charged. So when we present a negatively charged protein, in this case, these elastin-like proteins, it will trigger the assembly of the PA, but because of the mechanism I'm gonna show you, uh, it only happens at the interface. So that's what you see here. You have a solution of the protein, the peptide, and they only interact at the interface. This is basically in a capillary, just bringing two solutions, allowing that, that uh, assembly to take place. And what happens here, you form the diffusion reaction, this um, the diffusion barrier, which then triggers a diffusion reaction process. You have the for immediate formation of a layer. The small peptide is smaller, so it continues to diffuse towards the larger proteins triggering another assembly and continuing this diffusion reaction, diffusion reaction, generating a multi-layered multi membrane. This is what you see here. So here you have the two solutions, the membrane that is formed, the multi-layers that is formed in the manner that I was um, telling you of this diffusion reaction. And each one of these layers is formed by this composite PA, ELP or elastin-like protein, uh, protein. So it's basically a composite of the two. Now, what happens is, and this is something we found, if I can go back to the, now because of this architecture, because of this structure, and I really wanna go back to what I said at the beginning, that the complexity and the functionality of biological systems has a lot to do with, with the structure and that compositional complexity. So in this case, what you see here is a solution of the ELP. So we are mixing the two components, just like I'm showing on the left, but in this case, and this is where led my Carla as a PhD student, which Carla does here is inject a drop of the PA inside of a bigger solution of the ELP, and it triggers this diffusion reaction process, but the drop is inside of the ELP solution. And so you, go, you basically create a sac, like a balloon full of PA solution. And that membrane is this membrane that I'm showing you, that I'm showing you here but it's an unstable membrane. As soon as it touches the air water interface or the bottom glass, it opens up basically like a bubble of soap. When you touch a bubble of soap with a wet surface, what happens? You touch it, you, it, it binds, it's, it adheres, it opens up controllably and it seals the surface. And that's what you see here. Now, if we now take, now we look at the tube at the same tube, but now from the side and we, we um, inject 
ELP solution on the outside, we can grow the two because the assembly is taking place right at the interface. So as long as there's solution of the PA inside and solution of the ELP outside, they will continue to interact right at the interface. Now you see it here, the diameter begins to narrow, to decrease, and that's because we are, we are running we're, uh, we're basically uh, finishing the PA solution, depleting the PA solution that is inside. You can actually in inject PA solution on the inside and keep growing these tubular structures indefinitely. Uh, this is, again, another tube. Uh, this is an accelerated video, so about one minute of real time corresponds to one second of the, of the video. A tube is formed, opens at the top, opens at the bottom, similar to what I was showing here. But now we come with a piece of PDMS, touch the surface. Remember I told you like a bubble of soap, you touch it, it opens up controllably, seals to the surface. And we now bring the PDMS away from the tube, from the wall. And as long as there's PA inside and ELP outside, another tube will grow. This is another video um, that we're doing the same, but we're pulling longer. So you can see that the tube breaks, but it breaks into layers. So you see these layers uh, that are being broken. Those are actually the layers on the outside. These are the more rigid layers. The ones on the inside are more flexible and they maintain that diffusion barrier across which you have the PA diffusing and therefore the healing of this membrane. Okay, so this is basically a, a very useful uh, system. It, it can only be assembled in water because there's no covalent cross-linking. We're relying heavily on electrostatic interactions and hydrophobic interactions. So as long as if you bring now different ions and salts, this actually competes with the system. However, this is when Yong Hao came in. So Yong Hao uh, was a PhD student and now a postdoc in the group. Um, she started to look at ways to enhance that that um, uh, the, the structural integrity of these materials. And she found that actually, if you remove the PA and you basically just end up with the graphic, with graphene oxide, graphene oxide flakes and the ELP, you trigger another diffusion barrier, which means you then trigger the diffusion reaction process and you end up again with a stable membrane. However, in this case, we get an, a much stronger interaction. And, and I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Basically what's happening here is you have opposite charge. The ELPs, uh, these proteins are disordered, highly disordered. So they will be able to conform when they see these graphene oxide stacks, which is basically what, what they see. And they begin to surround those graphene oxide stacks, even going within the inside of the graphene oxide stacks. And actually we saw this uh, with different techniques such as such as SANS. And so basically this enables us now to generate a similar membrane, similar tubular structures, but much more, um, which, but much stronger, which have much higher structural integrity. So this enables us now, for example, to start printing. So here we have in green, the ELP being printed into a, into a pool of graphene oxide. And again, as soon as it's coming out, the membrane is forming, but it's only forming on the extruded rod that is coming out. So you end up with a tubular structure. And basically you can begin to generate these, um, these, um, these fluidic devices. Again, the tube is formed by self-assembly. We've gone down to about 50 microns, even 10 microns in diameter um, uh, of, of the tube. You can see here the multi-layer structure of the graphene oxide ELP of the cross section of the membrane. And again, the important thing is because of that high affinity, these are actually functional structures. So you can see here when we flow these green dyes, um, play again, you can see that they're, they're, and there's no covalent cross-linking. Again, this is just the two components interacting, but enabling this, this type of structure and this type of robust structure. Now they're still soft. So you, I don't know if you saw here, they're still, um, um, when you pulsate the flow, they still move, which is something we want. This is part of, we're trying to recreate how biological materials behave. And actually a, a lot of these capillaries are actually quite soft. We don't want very hard polymeric structures. I mentioned that they can assemble in the presence of salt, so we can actually print with cells. So here you have here, for example, in these green cells, that means that when you assemble the tubes, that the cells are embedded within the wall, 
and also on the, on the lumen of the tube. Now these cells, these are endothelial cells that grow very well on these materials. And you can see here when compared, for example, to tissue culture plastic, they have a similar uh, level of proliferation. So it was very interesting to see how these cells like this material. And I'll come back on an example of why this is important. Obviously for this one is because we want to endothelialize those tubular structures. We want to generate tubes that, that have these endothelial cells growing within them and on the wall. These cells are able to produce a basement membrane, and we're still characterizing some of this uh, of the membrane, but we do see this, this production of, of matrix. And um, these are permeable materials. And what you see here is the decrease uh, in permeability with, with higher levels of, of endothelialization. So the more cells you have, the less permeable they are, which is what you want. You want to, to control permeability by the presence of cells, basically. And so what I hope you see is what we have here is a way to grow by self-assembly fluidic devices that have properties that can emulate some of the properties of biological systems, such as capillaries. So they are soft, but they're still functional. You can perfuse them. They are permeable. They can be endothelialized. And so this is the work of Elena, who's a new postdoc in the group, turning this technology into, into basically organ on chip devices. Okay, so I'm going to continue with this same material, but before I want to just introduce this application. So in melanoma is a type of cancer of the skin. Um, it's basic, it's very aggressive. So it requires these surgical resections when you treat it. You, you need to be able to remove the cancer, but it is so aggressive that you require a very large surgical resection. So you really need to make, you go around it far from the, from the tumor and remove a large piece of, piece of tissue. This is to, to make sure that, that all the cancer cells are removed. Now, when that happens, obviously you create a big injury in the tissue and that delays healing. Um, also, it's been found that with, with some uh, chemotherapies, the cancer can, can actually develop resistance to the chemotherapy. And so what we, uh, we decided to, to develop was a, a, a membrane using the material I was showing you for photothermal therapy. And I just wanted to tell you what photothermal therapy, this is basically you use a photothermal agent, which actually heats up when you shine light near infrared. And this is just an example from this paper that I took just to show you that what happens is you can incorporate this, photo, this photothermal agent in different ways. Usually these are particles that are then in the presence of cells or so they're uptaken by the cells. Near infrared is shine, these particles then heat up, they're conductive, so they heat up and then they kill the cells. Now, what we wanna to try to do is using that membrane that I was showing you with the graphene oxide and the elastin protein to create surgical dressings for post-operative photothermal treatment. So after the surgery, after this is, the cancer is removed, we want to create a dressing that can be applied and can reduce the area of resection. So it can make the surgery with a smaller, with a smaller area, smaller volume of tissue being removed, um, eliminates residual tumor cells, inhibits recurrence or minimizes the recurrence of cells, and then uh, also promotes healing. Now, all these elements basically is what we have in our membrane. I go back to this GOELP material I was showing you. Because remember what I showed you that endothelial cells like this material. So you can see here proliferate, they really like to grow with this material. So perhaps if we can turn this into a surgical dressing that is conductive, which means we need to make this graphene oxide conductive, we can have that dressing, that, that surgical dressing I was telling you. And this is what we want. We want to be able to have, again, our ELP graphene oxide membrane, shine, be able to put it on the, on the tissue. But now, because of the, of the, of the properties I'm gonna show you, we, we want to be able to remove less amount of tissue. So less amount of tissue uh, of, of resection, shine near infrared light and heat it up to a level that is known to heal melanoma cells, but not the other cells, the healthy cells. So this is, again, John Howe developed this, and I don't have a lot of time to tell you about this. It's a paper that just got accepted. Um, develop a, a process that allows us 
to reduce graphene oxide within this composite of the EOPGO, but at a, at a low enough temperature so that you maintain the structure. Um, I'll have to go very quickly on this. This is basically showing us this, this method uses 70% ethanol. This is because it allows to go within the geo stacks to remove the oxygen groups. Um, and we can see this collapse of the geo, of the geo um, ELP composite, um, which has to do with the reduction of the geo. And again, I don't have a lot of time to tell you about this, but just to show you how we're doing this, because basically we're turning these membranes into conductive membranes. So they are applied. So these are, this is a mice study. They're applied on the skin of a mice, of mice with, with uh, melanoma. And you can see in this case, the melanoma is removed. So similar to what you would do in a surgery, you remove the melanoma, you apply our material, which is this, and then you shine light. But I want you to appreciate how, how little of this treatment it's required. So after 50, only 15 seconds of treatment of application of near infrared every 48 hours for two weeks. And you can see that in the, in the control animals that were not treated, they were simply exposed to near infrared the cancer came back. This is the black line. When you have GO, they also come back a little later, but when you have our ELP GO membrane uh, dressing, it doesn't come back, which is what we want. We want to be able to kill all those remaining cells and prevent recurrence. And also we were able to close and to heal the injury. Remember that we want to make sure that this uh, heals up fast. We are able to heal the injury faster um, compared to the other material. So this is a material, this is a surgical dressing that allows us to do this post-operative photothermal treatment, prevent cancer recurrence, but also enhance the regeneration of the tissue to heal up faster. And the last example I wanna show you with this idea of interfacial self-assembly, when we bring two different components, it's for this application. And the concept is here, can we use the same approach but now harness, use molecules that are present in the body. And the example here, the application we've, we've worked on is on amniotic membrane. So there are, there are uh, situations in which the doctor needs to do surgery on an embryo. On an embryo. And, when, when that, and that requires the doctor to go through with a probe, break the amniotic membrane with a hole, which is what you see here. And, and that needs to be, that needs to heal up. It needs to heal up immediately. Basically, this is a very flexible, strong membrane that needs to grow. It's full of liquid. So it's very difficult to plug this. There are different ways in which people have been using such as collagen plugs, but it's actually, it's not, it's not very good, the current, the current gold standard. So what we are been working on, you know, again, using that interfacial self-assembly can we use peptides so that they are, they are basically um, presented at the surface of the amniotic membrane, right at the surface where you have amniotic fluid inside and here's the outside, you present the peptides and they would trigger the assembly of that, of that membrane, that interfacial self-assembly membrane immediately. And that's what you see here, if I can play this. This is again, here you have our self-assembly peptides that are designed to to co-assemble with, with components that are present in amniotic fluid. So if I play this video, you'll see the amniotic fluid is here. As soon as we inject the peptide, the peptide is able to trigger the assembly again through this diffusion reaction process into this, into this stable membrane. And you can see that the amniotic fluid is not able to come out. Now, this is just a, um, a uh, proof of concept. There are other limitations here that we need to work on, but it, it is an example of how we can use multi-component self-assembly, and in this case, using molecules present in the body to create materials and implants directly in the body. All right, so that's my talk. Just want to finalize, just to summarize what I've been showing you is basically our work generating this supramolecular toolkit um, using these biological organization principles as, as engineering steps of, of fabrication processes to, to, to fabricate materials, again, for in vitro models, but also for, for implants and for tissue regeneration. So with that, I, I just like to finish acknowledging the people in our group. I presented the people that conducted, this is the, the current members of our group. Uh, I presented the people that developed the work, uh, 
I acknowledge the collaborators that that have been we've been have been critical really to develop all these all these projects. We are a group that likes to collaborate. Um, in our publications, we usually have a lot of people from different places. Um, and uh, this is our group. And finally, to thank our funding sources. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this exciting talk. Um, do you think the self-assembly has um, can take the organs on a chip or in vitro models to the next level? Yeah, well, this is it's it's something we're working on. It, it certainly has advantages. There are also complications and challenges that we work on. How to incorporate these self-assembly materials? I mean, the, the, this brings to, actually, this is a very good question because both of these, we're trying to unify two fields that were developed completely apart from each other. So you have the bottom-up approach, supramolecular chemistry, that has been developed with certain rules and with certain uh, approaches that is very difficult, different from top-down approaches, add, additive manufacturing, um, uh, you know, all these are very different. So, so actually integrating them is not a simple, it's, not a, it's something we're working on, we're very interested in, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm showing you what we're doing, but there remains challenges, but I believe that there are certain advantages that it can provide. And again, I go back to my first point, which is if we really want to recreate biological tissues in vitro, we need to embrace complexity. We need to make things more complex. That's how biological systems work. And if we're trying to understand how they work and, and, and test things on them, we need to have a level of complexity that is functional. And hopefully what we're trying to do is develop mechanisms and processes that are simple. So generate complexity in a simple manner. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question is, can you conduct your assembly in vivo? Use the animal host. Yeah, well, that was that's what that's something we are working on at the moment. That is that is that is last example with the amniotic membrane that's still in vitro, but that this goes to, um, you know, that's that's our goal, and we are working on different approaches to move that way. One other question came in. Thanks for the talk. How much does the size of the small molecules, e.g., self-assembling peptides, play a role? The size of the small of the peptides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they play a role a lot. The, the structure in general plays a role a lot. And I think this is a challenge, but also an opportunity because it means that we can really develop a toolkit to generate, to control properties and to control structure. We've seen, I didn't show this, but if you remember those tubular structures that we were growing, Right, the tubes that you're growing simply by self-assembly, um, and they were opening up. We develop another system with using the same ELPs, and the PA only had one amino acid less, one less amino acid, but that was enough to trigger a different diffusion reaction process that generated a structure that did not enable it to uh, to open up, and therefore didn't enable it to grow. So. That's an example of how important this is. So it, needs, it requires calibration, but once you have it, you can see, hopefully you can see some of the properties that you're able to access. Thank you. Uh, another question came in, what type of hydrogels offer better results? Um, depends on what application, what type of hydrogels offer better results? Mm -hmm. Um, like alginate, I, gelatin, you know, there's lots of biomaterials. Yeah, but it, it, they all depend on what you want to do. These materials are very good and excellent for a variety of, of applications. What we're trying to develop here is, is an alternative to those materials uh, where we can enhance the compositional complexity, for example, in the tumor models that we show. And, and I mentioned that particular example. Where we're comparing our complex hydrogel with different ECM components and the PAs with PAs alone. And we could see a, clearly a difference on how the cells were behaving. So I cannot answer that question because it depends on, on the application and what you want to, to achieve. Thank you. Um, remember earlier on people were developing microgels and, and they were trying to assemble them and they were using even DNA 
to assemble them at the right format. Mm -hmm. Can you use self-assembly to assemble microgels or yeah. other things? Yeah, yeah, this is very good. There are a number of groups uh, working um, working on this. Um, so two things. So first is the use of DNA because you can use again similar um, uh, molecular interactions to control the assembly. And people have used not only DNA alone but peptides with DNA, proteins with DNA. That's one level. But there's also the other things of of microgels. Um, there's a variety of people really looking at this. Jason Burdick comes to mind, Tatiana Segura, Burdick in Pennsylvania, Tatiana Segura at Duke. There's a number of people looking at these microgels and what you can do with it. It's a very interesting approach. Thank you. Another question, Eamon. What are the strategies to incorporate blood and, it, and its complexities when developing in vitro and ex vivo models? Can you repeat that, Mehmet? Sorry. Yes. What are the strategies to incorporate blood and its complexities when developing in vitro models? Um, well, <laughs> um, these strategies to incorporate. I mean, the, the, the nice thing about blood is that you can work with blood uh, fractions. There's a lot of people working with blood fractions. Blood is an extremely complex fluid. Um, and, and I think there are different ways in which you could incorporate this uh, working with, with fractions and with uh, smaller components. So, so it's in a, with the simpler fluids. Uh, it's, it's a very general question again, and it's, I will have to have more specifics. Um, but, but again, I, I hope that what I was showing is that I was showing you how it is possible to work with more complex fluids. So I, I, I showed you in the transfer models, for example, we were working with fluids that had three and four different proteins. And at the last one, I, I showed how we're working with amniotic fluid, already a, a very, very complex fluid. So, so it is possible to do this. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, these are very creative, innovative ideas. The question is, where do you find your inspiration? Nature, developmental biology, insects, any thoughts? Yeah, this is this is very good. I think one, um, I think the interdisciplinarity is very important because we 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 do have people in the lab, and I was actually very very lucky to be in labs, being trained in labs that were also very interdisciplinary, and so that interdisciplinarity really triggers different ideas now. The challenge about that is that you need to be, I always tell my students, you need to feel comfortable not knowing. You need to feel comfortable uh, really just not knowing what's going on <laughs> because you need to put, put yourself in that vulnerable position to be able to be exposed to new ideas. And little by little, you're able to then provide a very different point of view. So interdisciplinarity is one. Um, in the lab, the other, the other thing that is good in, in our lab, we try to keep a very open mind on, on things. So, so we, we explore basic science questions, but also we explore very, very targeted, uh, uh, targeted applications and translation. I think that that capability of working on both, again, fits one and the other. Um, but anyway, I'm happy, happy to, to, to talk more about that to that person if, if, if the person contacts me. Okay. One other question came in. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Normally we know that the strength of the PHLs is low. Can you please compare your interfacial multi-layer PHLs in terms of strength and stability? Yeah, yes, yeah, a very good question. I, if, you, if you remember, um, this is why we're working on different mechanisms. So I presented the host guest system that was developed by Carlos in the group. This is a mechanism to enhance, and there are other ways in which people are enhancing the structural integrity of these gels. I present, specifically at the interface, I presented the PAELP, which I was actually strong enough to create these tubes, but it was quite a weak material. And then I presented the graphene oxide ELP, and that one turned out to be much more stronger. So we are able even to flow, perfuse these, these tubes, even a few minutes after the assembly with no covalent cross-linking. They're still soft. So there's, there is a, a um, you know, there's a challenge there, but I, would, I do wanna bring something up, which is 
biology is, is used to very, very soft structures. So even bone, how does bone regenerate? Bone regenerates always by going through a very soft material. So you take MSCs, they're in a very soft bone marrow environment. And that transition of stiffness uh, is actually very important and perhaps actually critical for the proper cell behavior and, and evolution of these cells on how they differentiate. So I am, and we are in the lab actually, um, um, you know, we are, we are interested in working with very soft materials. The problem is to fabricate very fine structures. The technologies that we have, we tend to have only allow for much harder materials. And so I think this presents an opportunity. If you're working with soft materials, you can begin to, to analyze and to, to try. What we're trying to do is create fabrication processes that allows us to, to fabricate with these soft materials. And we see, just like in the cancer, two cancer examples I showed, that the functionality is, seems to be quite, and also in the, in the endothelial cells growing on the GOELP tubes. So yeah. I don't know if I answered the question, but it's a, it's a good question. I just, I was philosophizing on it. Thank you. Another question came in. Does cations, cat ions play any role? Could slowing the assembling the structure through ionic screening would yeah. result in better integrity and higher or, or higher ionic strength dissolving the materials? Yes, uh, both. Depends on what components you're co-assembling and they do play a role in the in the, in the co-assembly. So this is another parameter that is important to characterize when developing your systems. And the examples I showed you, we've gone through a stage in the, in the, in the work where we needed to develop a systematic understanding of what ions are, in, what ions and what role they're playing. Well, Alvaro, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. It was a fantastic talk, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mehmet. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so Have much. Have a nice day. See yeah. you soon. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. -bye. Bye.